call this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. I'll just begin by saying, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 38, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation for the public, in person for the school committee. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceeding that's provided for in the order. <clears throat> A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so by calling 1574-218-0185 with PIN 242 pound. That is the opening. We're going to begin tonight with public input. It doesn't seem like there's too many people from the public here, but if there are any members of the public that would like to address the school committee on anything that is not on the agenda, this is the time to do so. Hearing none, we move on. Usually we start with student report, but I don't believe we have any student report tonight. Is that correct, Dr. Dale? We do not. The students were just recently elected, and I hope to have everything set and ready to go for our next meeting of the government. Very good. Moving on quickly. Did you get everything up? So, school reopening, Dr. Daly, do you want to? Almost up. I can begin talking and get that going. So, uh, just a few updates. We have had, I believe since our last meeting, we have had a, a second and a third positive case, um, the third one coming this evening. So, just to recap, we had. Um, one staff member at the Hood School, we had a student at the Middle School, and then today we had a student at the Hood School. Um, and so, you know, our process has been very collaborative and cooperative with the town. Um, it's, it's been very efficient, I will say. Um, we, we, we have a process now where when it comes to our attention, usually it's the, the parents uh, bringing it to us, uh, to our attention to date. To clarify, none of these events to date have been transmitted at school that we're aware of. Everything has happened. Uh, the students or staff have received the notification because of a, another family member or someone at home. It's where it's come from. We're still trying to get all the details from today, as it just happened around 3.30 today. But we bring together our team of the nurses, the public health nurse, the director of public health, and uh, town administrator, chiefs, anyone that's available comes to the meeting. We huddle you know, for about 10 minutes or so, discuss the main issues, make sure that we have all the details around the current case, review such questions as who are the close contacts, um, were they on the bus, are they taking, you know, they participating in any after-school extracurriculars. That helps me to fine-tune the message that I'm able to put out and the, uh, the close contacts are then contacted. So we've learned a little bit from each experience. Today was actually the first one that happened during the school week. The others have been on the weekend. Um, and so today was, was the most efficient, I think, because it was during the school day and also because it's our third one and I think we've learned from each of the other two. Able to give just enough information not to, you know, uh, reveal anything that's confidential, but to provide people enough information so that they uh, know, know what's happening in the situation. I'm not sure if everyone here saw that message, but are there any questions that you have about uh, any of these updates? So my only question, well, I'll reiterate what you just said slightly differently. So you're saying none came from uh, the school transmission at school, <clears throat> presumably from the last two. There were no close contacts that, you know, ended up getting it from those people, correct? Correct. And then for the one today was a student in school, and then at the end of school, was, we, we were told, or was the student not in school today? The student was not in school today. Um, that is my understanding. The student was um, not feeling well over the weekend. They were not in school today. And then once they were positive, that's when everything kicks in. So the things um, we do not, you know, you do not begin quarantining or close contact tracing until someone tests positive. So that's. Um, so in terms of close contact, then the last contact that student would have had in school was on Friday. Correct. So you trace it back to a certain number of days um, from when that uh, when that happened. Any 
anybody else have questions about those cases? Any other updates on learning or anything else about? So yes, yeah. so thank you. So the, you know, things are going uh, well. I've had a great opportunity to observe um, several classes. I've seen uh, many different things that have been going on. You know, we had an opportunity at one of our parent advisory meetings that um, Mr. Briano and Mr. Buckley attended uh, to hear from the parents and uh, the parent organizations and some of the other organizations about how it's going with school reopening from the parent point of view, which was very helpful. There's been a lot of um, positive feedback that I've received several, you know, a few questions, I'd say, as well, about some different scenarios that we're trying to address to continuously improve what we're doing. I still feel that overall, um, the community is very thankful that we're in school and that things are going well as we're getting into, we've been in school for over a month now, just a little bit over a month. Um, there's definitely questions that parents are asking as they're seeing the differences between classrooms. And so what I think is important to communicate to everyone, which is what, uh, Mr. Buckley said as well is, you know, it's very important that we keep in mind how far along our teachers are and what they've done for students. And I think it's important that we realize too that we, we've seen two, two things emerge and two different ways to look at it um, from an instructional point of view. And one is we've seen some teachers that have used a lot of their classroom time to teach both the students in front of them and the students at home. And they've had some different ways of approaching that. We've had some great success. There's other teachers that have made some decisions, especially I think I've seen this in the younger grades, where they'll say, we're going to do some things whole group, and then we're going to break off more and have students at home working independently and students in the classroom working um, with the teacher. And what they're looking at there is that it's somewhat easier to um, really maximize what you're getting out of the students in front of you. What, what I'm hearing somewhat from some of the, the teachers as well. And sometimes the students in front of you are also on their computer. So it's essentially like everyone's remote. And then is that, is that the best use of the time when the students are actually in front of you, right? So there's, there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of exploring. There's sort of an essential question that we have. That whole concept of flipping the classroom is really what do we do when the students are in front of us to maximize the fact that they're in front of us. So it's a little bit different this year, a little bit of a a different way to look at that same question, but it's an important one. So all of our teachers have two goals this year, one around social justice and one around hybrid teaching and learning. And so what we're going to be exploring over the course of this year is first of all, hopefully around November 3rd, when we're going to spend time at our PD day exploring this, we have identified some best practices. So teachers are going to be sharing with each other who's had success, what are the pros, what are the cons of different approaches and what's working and how it can work. And what we're hoping to get to is the idea of if this is the best practice that everyone can work toward, that we can identify on sort of a scale where, where am I on that spectrum towards, towards meeting that goal and how can I make that my goal that you know, I'm going to be in a better place in December than I might be in October, in a better place in February than in December, so that we're working toward there. Because there's a lot of variables. Some people are just, A, very comfortable with that approach, very comfortable with the technology. The technology that they have works. There's, there's different variables that are, that are coming into play. And so, um, you know, I think it's very important. I guess my message to the community um, is, you know, we should be very thankful with all that our teachers are doing and don't compare too much what's happening in one class and another um, because that can be, that can take away from the greater goal that what we're trying to work toward here is all of our teachers and all of our students improving. And some of those, you know, Teachers that, that may not have the tech working in their room or are still learning it, are still adjusting, they're going to get more time with our digital learning folks. We've, we've posted for remote learning assistance. We have other ways of trying to provide resources and supports to all of those teachers. And I will say that you know, we, we do have some grants that have helped us with technology. We do have some other uh, purchases that have been made, but I think it's important for everyone to understand as well Everyone in this country right now is buying more computers than they've ever bought before um, for schools. And so the back orders and the demands on all of these devices for teacher laptops, for student devices, and for everything is, is behind. So we're trying to, you know, we were out ahead with a lot of our orders and we were able to get things like devices <coughs> for students. Um, but there's going to be a backlog in some of the devices and supports we need. And certainly if things start to break, 
as we try to replace them, we're facing some of those backlogs. So orders that we were told would be here by mid-October, it's now December, January, we're hearing on some of these things. So I think it's important for everyone to be patient and realize that there's never been sort of a run on technology the way there is right now in this country. So that's happening. So I think that's important to, to share. Um, you know, I, I've been able to get down to the field and see a couple of sporting events this week. I think uh, everything has worked very well. I know that it was shared with the school committee. Um, gratitude for the efforts of the committee to, to really look at the spectators being allowed. I think that the ultimate plan that we came up with was the home parents being able to participate um, and to complete the screener has worked really, really well. I was there at the game today. Everyone is way more than six feet apart. You know, there's plenty of room for people in those stands. Um, the visiting teams are able to go on the fence and, and be from outside, um, but it does allow for, for those home parents to be in the stands cheering on their, their, their team, which I think has worked out really well. Um, and so far, so good with the, with the tool, I think, has worked out well. So all good there. And thank you to our athletic director and, and high school principal for making all that happen. Um, one thing that I want to share out, um, we've also got the extracurriculars starting. You know, we're, we're at this point now where a lot of our outdoor classes are still happening, but we're starting to come inside. So we're looking at trying to figure out uh, what the next steps are there. I think it's important to share that at this moment, you know, I don't see winter sports beginning right after. We'll talk about this maybe a little bit later as well, but I don't see the winter sports are going to start right after Thanksgiving break as they have in the past. Um, at the very least, we may need more time to, to see what uh, can happen with some of those indoor sports and activities. Um, we are looking at the ways that we're in, what, what classes are going to look like for band, for music, for chorus, um, and for phys ed as they come inside. Those are all going to still happen, obviously, but we have to really think about what kind of activities, what kind of spacing, how can it be done safely, and um, both, both groups are, are very well aware of um, what is possible and how to make that work. So we're well we're well aware of those things and we're working on them. And at the high school, I think everyone is aware that we are putting on a show for the community that our high school master students are doing, and it's a sort of a stroll where, where folks buy tickets in advance and they're able to walk safely and socially distanced um, in small groups, basically all around our entire campus. So it's it's a small offshoot of part of a show that they had last year with the haunted playground. And uh, the students did a fantastic job coming up with this whole idea. And quite honestly, the civic project aspect of what they had to go through to plan this out and to go in, um, they had to present at the Board of Health. So just think of what they're learning as students. All the key people that they have to talk to from the, the police and the school safety officers, the fire department, just for the regular permitting piece of it, but then the additional Board of Health kind of requirements that they went through this year. So, you know, hats off to Mrs. Kane for a great program and for leading that, and really to the student leaders that were, um, you know, so articulate in expressing their their ideas and, and getting them approved by the Board of Health. So that was that was fantastic. Um, one thing I just want to share in in closing here is, you know, I, I mentioned last time about the school calendar that we have is designed for a typical school year. None of that and the breaks that are in there are not designed for maybe what we're facing this year. And I, I certainly, the teachers have done a fantastic job. They are, they are really uh, putting themselves out there, working very, very hard, and doing something, you know, for all of us that have sat through, you know, a day of, of online meetings, one after the other after the other, it's exhausting in a way like we never felt before. And I think our teachers are, are getting to a point where the, the anxiety level is getting a little bit high. And anything that we can do to try to think about ways to lessen that anxiety, um, I think would be very helpful. I've also been hearing from some parents that have asked questions about what are we doing to quarantine or to, um, you know, what advice are we giving around travel or quarantine around the holidays. So a thought that was suggested to me today, part of what I try to do is have good two-way communication with our staff. And a teacher actually suggested an idea today, which was a little bit different than, than something I had thought of before. So I want to share that idea with you now. And if it's something that there's an appetite to discuss, um, I would suggest that we um, possibly discuss it in our next meeting in more detail. 
and possibly vote on a change to our calendar to accommodate this idea. I have shared this with our administrative team and they sort of, um, all of them uh, agree that this is a good idea for what they're sensing in the buildings right now and to make sense. So the, the basic suggestion is that we look ahead to the Thanksgiving week, which is the days leading up to, we always have a Wednesday dismissal before Thanksgiving. So the two days going up to that and that half day Wednesday would be full remote. So we would let folks know well in advance that those days are remote for everyone, teachers, students, all students. Um, so essentially what that allows you to do is to, for families, staff and families to make the best decisions possible about quarantining and holiday gatherings, everything they're going to do. So the recommendations are obviously don't have large groups to, to, you know, to limit travel, but this would allow any of those conversations because essentially at that point, because you're not coming to school and you're working remotely, you can really keep tabs on your immediate household and watch for symptoms and you can really see whether people have gone out or done anything. You could quarantine if you wanted to starting on that Friday leading into the Thanksgiving holiday. So that's the thought there. This year's calendar is kind of unique in the way it's set up and that we have a very similar structure leading into the Christmas holiday as well. It's a Monday, Tuesday, and a Wednesday dismissal is what's in our calendar. And so the suggestion would be to do both, to let people know now in advance that we have the, that those two and a half days are remote, and then the rest of the week obviously is a part of the, the break. So we, you know, the administrative team thought about this, talked about it a little bit uh, over the course of today. We feel that that might go a long way to, to lessening some of the, the anxiety that our teachers and staff are feeling right now and a lot of the parents as well. So that's something if we want to just discuss for a moment and then if, if we feel that it's worthy of discussion, we can bring it forward again uh, next time with the idea to adopt the calendar. So I just wanted to put that out there. Any thoughts? Thank you very much. So why don't we start with that and then we can talk about other questions on opening. Anybody have any thoughts on the full remote days for before Thanksgiving? Sure, this, this is Rich McGowan. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a sensible idea and I, I like being responsive to the sort of anxiety in the building. Um, our next meeting is tentatively scheduled for November 5th, I believe. Um, do we feel like that's enough time to formalize that change and give everyone notice? That's a good question. I, I'm thinking that too. I mean, it gives you at least three weeks um, from that. That's a Thursday, right? Yeah, it's like so. So two and a half weeks before the Monday, the first change would be the Monday, yeah. Yeah. And that maybe I'm just throwing it out there as is that enough? Time? I, I think I think we decided on it. I think we've done some change. We did a half day change last week, which is the week before. Yep. So. Well, I think if you were changing it to the opposite, where you were remote, and then now you want kids to come to school, it would be a, a different thing. But I think two weeks is a good enough notice that, hey, you can stay home. And Any other thoughts, Jim? Diana? I think it seems reasonable, especially, you know, anything to help the teachers feel more comfortable. They're going through a lot right now and it's really stressful. Um, I can say from a parent perspective, I actually think it's a good thing for me. I, I'm sure there's other parents where, you know, the notice would be helpful for, you know, child arrangements that they do have to work. So the earlier we can get it out, the better. But, um, you know, I, I'd rather my kids, you know, home that week. I think a lot of people take it off anyway. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, I, I agree. I think it makes sense from a health standpoint and from a mental health standpoint. Um, one, one thing that sticks out to me is that for both the week before Christmas and the week of Thanksgiving, it's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we might want to see if it's worth juggling. Co it's going to have the same cohort twice. Yeah. It kind of, it's not Robin, but then that's like six days taken out. So if there's a way to balance that, that, that might be nice. But in general, I think it's a great idea. Awesome. I did think I haven't looked that far into it to see, but we would want to make that balance as best yeah. we can. Yeah, mate. I think so. I mean, for my thoughts, and this Scott, I think um, the balance is a big thing. You know, about making, and I know they were already looking at there were going to be Thursday, Fridays off either way, so they were adjusting the Wednesdays. I think to account for that. 
So the price just had to readjust because as it was, it was going to be one cohort was there and one cohort wasn't. <coughs> now it'll be none of them are there. Um, I mean, my, my thoughts are sort of two. Uh, on the one hand, I think we should do whatever the teachers want to do. I mean, whatever the administrators and teachers think, I don't think it should be the school committee that's holding up that up. I think if the administration and the teachers and the unions agree on something, we should pretty much agree with it. And so, frankly, I feel like you know, it's the educators' job to think about that. And if they think this is a good idea, I don't think we should stand in the way of that. Um, <clears throat> the only question that I would have about the education is cohort C. You know, about it. especially kids that have special needs. Like my son is in cohort C. I know that. You know, the other day he had to stay home for a day, and it's again, I was I was the paraprofessional for the day. I had a day off, and I was there for every class, and. I think that's the one group that I'm slightly worried about, and I don't know if there's a way where, I don't know, where anything can be done, where even if, you know, the distance learning lab was open or something, if somebody needed to come in to do, to do remote in the school, maybe not in the tra traditional way. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's an option, but I don't know. And there's not a lot of kids that are in cohort C, so I don't know that we should not do something because, you know, 20 kids across the district need something different, but. That was the only thought that I had was, you know, a few kids that might get a lot of additional services. How would they, you know, how, how would they take those, you know, additional six days? So, but okay. ultimately, I think you. I, ultimately, I think if you come up with a plan that the teachers union and the administrators are behind, I don't think you'll have, have anybody in this committee voting against it. It's a good idea that we'll bring that back. My thought at this moment, though, is just for the, the purposes that we're trying to do this, it would just be for everyone. Yeah. And, and I think even if, you know, I think, you know, I think this is the one situation where I'm thinking it might be fair. Even if we were closing for other reasons, we might yeah. still try to do something. So that's the thought. Um, to be completely honest, I haven't talked to the, the NREA about this yet or the Paris Union, the two largest unions yet. Um, I imagine that they would be or something like this. I have talked to them about doing something to address the, uh, you know, just the levels. And I, and I think it's just something we're hearing in society. I think there's a lot out there in the media about, you know, rises in cases and, you know, uh, there's just a lot. And I think everyone's just, just feeling that. And also, you know, it's very hard to compare to other districts. We, like I said, we're, we're over a month. There's a lot of districts that are just starting to go back now. And so they're, 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 they're going through the same issues that we went through in, in August and September. Um, but I'm, we're going through some different kind of issues that, that we're feeling, and I think um, to recognize that they've come quite so far, and I think having those little, um, those two pieces there might really provide some, uh, some help, so. All right, so that's something that sounds like I could put on the agenda for next time for us to discuss further. Okay. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on reopening from anybody? Questions, concerns? You know, the only thing I was just going to add is, you know, uh, as Dr. Daly mentioned, Janine and I were at the uh, parent advisory meeting, and I, I just think it's worth noting, as Dr. Daly just alluded to a bit, that every district's different right now, and we need to do the best we can to make North Reading plan work as well as we can, but it's also worth recognizing that North Reading's in a very different position than a lot of other districts around here. And so I'm on the list serve with that school committees, and we see, you know, we see Everybody talking about trying to get plans to open. I mean, school districts were talking about how they have elementary open. They have a plan to open middle school in high in November. They don't even have a plan for high school. They don't have staffing. They don't have you know agreements with teachers. And you know, I think I think it's just worth noting that even if there are things that need to be tinkered with and adjusted, that we are very fortunate in North Reading that we have a lot of buy-in from. All the different groups that are at stake here. Um, I mean, I, and I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it's been to have these. I've had a lot of great discussions over the summer with teachers and the teachers union working with the district to really make this work. And you know, it's just, I don't know, for me, I would just say I'm, I'm so grateful and thankful that our teachers are doing what they're doing. And we all wish it, we all wish we could be back normal, but. Until this passes, it's important that we're all on the same side. So I just, you know, just for the parents that might be listening, it's important to understand that, you know, everything that's happening right now, there's a lot of discussion going on, and the teachers are are behind this, and they're working with the school districts and the administration to try to find the best plan possible.
Mr. Buckley? Yeah. And one more thing, which is that um, <coughs> it, I was talking about uh, I was uh, I was thinking about this earlier when we got the uh, the notice of the the third case of a, of a person in the community uh, in the school community having COVID, and it occurred to me that every time that happens and it doesn't spread, that's a, a very clear sign that we're doing an excellent job in terms of how we're executing our plan, <coughs> that it makes sense, that it works, people are taking it seriously. And, uh, you know, you, you can't stop a, a contagion from spreading to people, but containing it like we've been doing, I think that, uh, I think we've done an excellent job so far. And, and, and just to hear that the student today had some symptoms that didn't come to school. Yep, exactly. You know, and I, and I know one of the issues that's coming up right now is maybe kids abusing and staying home when you know there's not reasons. I've seen some emails from principals about you know if you're if you're feeling well, you can't just oversleep and just decide to take a remote day. But it, it is important to do it. I mean, I, I will say from my own personal experience, last week, you know, last weekend or Columbus Day weekend, one of my kids had a runny nose. I was like, just a cold, but brought him to the pediatrician, got a COVID test, kept them home until we got the negative result just to make sure, you know, and, and I'll tell you, as a parent, it was like, you know, by Monday, he was perfect, or Tuesday, he was perfectly fine. He was running around the house like, I mean, by Monday, he was fine, but we hadn't gotten the test yet and, you know, be overly cautious in these situations because you never want to have a, you know, you, you, you're pretty sure it's a call, but, you know, you just don't know for sure. Yeah. But I think overall people are taking it seriously and they're doing the right thing. But, and I'll just reiterate too what I put out in my email about travel mm -hmm. and you know we, we are doing something a little bit different in our schools that's a little bit above a governor's travel order which basically the travel order says if you travel out of state to a state that's um, not a low risk state, so any state that's colored red, you need to produce a negative test or you need to quarantine. Um, there, there is language there that children under a certain age do not need to follow those rules, but we are saying all students, regardless, need to produce that negative test in order to come back to school. And I just want to reiterate here, as I did in my email, that it's, you know, it's not really about that student or your family, it's about what that means for the big picture, right? So it's about trust. We've built trust with all of our teachers and all the staff that are coming into school every day, and we have to trust that if people travel, they're going to do the right thing. If people are feeling sick, they're going to do the right thing. And that's why completing that daily health screener, having a conversation with the nurse or the principal, if there's any questions, is, is key. And 99% you know, of the time this happens, but when it doesn't happen, um, it very quickly becomes a situation that the trust is broken, and all of a sudden, the whole uh, conversation is in question, right, about what, what we can do and whether we can continue to have school as we're having. So it's very important that everyone continue to follow those rules, complete that screener before you come on campus, and have any questions that you uh, want to discuss with the nurse. So please continue to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on for new business, we have large capital presentation. Turn it over to Mr. I'm going to advance the slides on the screen as well. So, so in your packet, um, you should have had a PowerPoint as well as the five-year capital plan that um, we've updated to reflect projects that have been approved and. Um, you know, we made some alterations to the plan from last year to reflect the most up-to-date information. Um, so I'm going to kind of move through the slides relatively quickly um, and then leave time for discussion and questions at the end. But there's, there's a lot to kind of go through. Um, I'm going to touch upon some of the capital projects that we've completed in fiscal 21 as a refresher and reminder of some of the items that we were able to get done and approved this year. I want to focus the conversation on next year's projects for fiscal year 22. I'll give you kind of an outlook about the next um, the next three years, fiscal 23 and 24, which is what the CIPC will focus on. At the end, I'll touch upon their timeline and their process this year, which has been pushed out a little bit. Um, and then we'll certainly need time for discussions and questions. 
Um, we're not tonight. We're not looking for an endorsement or a, a vote of the plan. We're just opening it up um, to give you the information, give you a chance to digest it, ask some questions, and then next time we're together, um, we'll be asking for an official vote, and we'll see if we have to make any changes as we as we go. Um, so as a reminder, in fiscal 21, um, we were able to get the F350 pickup truck. The 2009 vehicle approved at the June 29th town meeting. So that was a, a positive thing. We have ordered that vehicle. We did that in July, soon after town meeting. Um, they built this vehicle from scratch. We ordered, placed our order along with the Department of Public Works order, both ordering the exact same vehicle. We're told it's on case to arrive in the beginning of December. So hopefully that happens before the, the snow winter season. Um, pleased to report that the fall town meeting um, a couple weeks ago, we did receive two other facility related projects approval. The little, little school HVAC upgrade that would focus on making improvements to the C wing of the school, as well as to the uh, Hood School Handicap Accessible Chair, which was 30 years old and needs to be certainly uh, replaced. So we are in the process, we've actually already ordered the, the, the chairlift. We're in the process of actually submitting bid specs, um, putting together bid specs for the HVAC project that does need to be bid as it is over the threshold um, cost of that, that project. It is a chapter 149 project that does require bidding. So we're in the process of hoping to get that out soon. Um, question? Yeah, quick question on that. What's the timeline on that? Will that be for this? Year still, so that we can, because I know yes. the funds are have to be in the year, right? So, right, so that that will be for this year. So, we'll be able to hopefully move forward on these and get these completed um, as soon as possible, really. So, the, the goal certainly for um, the HVAC project is to be, is have that completed as much before the winter season as we can. Uh, but it does have to go through the bidding process, so that, that will take a little bit of time there. Uh, and then there's an update on the LED lighting project. Um, so everyone knows that we do have the LED lighting project underway. Um, we didn't we kind of did that separately outside of the GIPC process to sort of, to not to kind of secure the funding for other town-wide projects. So we're sort of releasing this project. Um, we expect that project to be completed potentially by Friday of this week, maybe early next week. They're on their final school which is the Hood Elementary School, so we're a little bit um, behind timeline, but certainly things, things happen, we have a bit delayed here and there. Um, but the project all in all has gone really, really well. Um, and I'm already seeing, and I look at the October um, electricity in bills, that they're saving there. The usage is down 25, 30% um, in some areas, and um, it's definitely, you can tell right away that the savings is gonna be real, and, and it's definitely there. So that, that's between, and I think the light looks great actually. I walked around some of the buildings, it's a picture of the most of high school classroom, but a little bit of fresher light, a little bit of a more natural light, and I think, I think it looks, looks great. I think it's provided some much, much needed brightness in certain areas. Are they, are they still on budget even though it's over time? Yeah, they're still on budget. Yeah, so that's kind of, that's, that's actually fixed for us. Okay, so we make sure you don't have the liability there, which is good. Um, some other projects just that we did during the summer, part of it was COVID-19 related, um, but some other kind of capital items, we obviously did some upgrades to and repairs to a lot of exterior windows at the bachelor school and the hood schools. Those projects are completed. So now all the windows are kind of operable for, for ventilation that, um, for some of those window projects um, at, the, at the bachelor school, mainly the fourth, fourth floor and the, and the hood school classrooms. Um, we replaced some exterior doors at the little school that just needed to be replaced. We did some of these kind of small capital projects over the summer. Uh, we did those major HVAC upgrades and all those projects are completed. So we did the, the ionizing project at the middle school and the high school for additional mitigation of, of um, ventilation and exchange of air. So that project's been completed. We did sort of a similar approach to the bachelor school, but we opted for kind of the UV lighting approach to those rooftop units based on the size of those units. That project's been completed. And the Hood Middle School, we've upgraded the MER 13 filters and all those you know, classroom unit ventilators and rooftop units. So uh, in some areas, the rooftop units at the fashion school as well. So we, we've made some, some upgrades at the HVAC. 
The majority of these funds are being uh, COVID related, so we are using the CARES Act funding and the reopening funding um, to support this cost of this project, but certainly uh, capital related. Uh, we did install two additional security cameras in this building at doors 30 and 31, which is on the, ac the ed academic wing. Um, of the high school because we're now using those entrances regularly. That was a request from the police office, uh, police department, and we did move pretty quickly on that and got those up and running. So we have two additional security cameras that are tied into the police department's feed as well, live feed. Um, so just some other items to make you aware of. So if we look at, just a reminder, we're looking at um, large capital now, so greater than 25,000 with a useful life of more than five years qualifies for a large capital project. We generally are looking at vehicles, um, technology and facilities, most of our equipment um, acquisitions fall in small capital, furniture and, and some of the smaller technology, but um, <clears throat> this is the three areas that we, we tend to look at for large capital. Here's a quick snapshot um, of the three-year request that's been revised. So you can see kind of vehicles, um, pretty consistent amounts um, over the next few years, same for technology, a little bit higher next year, partly because some projects were deferred from this year's process. And then on the facility standpoint, we're doing our best to kind of spread and even out the need. Um, in the later years, starting in fiscal 24 and even 25 or 26, we look at the five-year plan, we start to look at some higher cost items, potentially like the little school modular replacement. Um, for that, that classroom. Um, potentially hood school boilers, uh, hood school boiler project, and hood school roof restoration. All three areas are in relatively good condition right now, so we're going to continue to assess these as we get closer, but there's a good chance we might be able to continue to kind of push those off. I think the, the boilers are in pretty good condition. The roof, we've made some small repairs in areas, but they're definitely items that are going to need to be addressed um, probably within this, this five year window as we look at our large capital plan. Um, so we're going to focus on technology for fiscal 22. We have two requests. The first is the annual allotment of $60,000 that we did not get this year, but we feel it's very important that we establish a computer replacement plan and an ongoing amount of about $60,000 we feel is needed. That will essentially work to address both replacements for both student devices as well as teacher devices, so there's a need in both areas. Um, we were able to acquire and accelerate through some state funding, through the advocacy of um, Brad Jones, um, State Representative Brad Jones, who helped us get some grant funding to buy some Chromebooks for the one-to-one -one initiative, um, as well as through some technology grants, essentials grants through um, the COVID-19 federal relief process. Um, in the reopening grant, we've been able to kind of accelerate our need to buy additional Chromebooks for student devices. So we've been accelerating that one-to-one -one initiative, we're almost one-to-one -one throughout, throughout the district, essentially. So there's definitely a need um, to replace these devices as they reach the end of their useful life and to have an ongoing allotment of about $60,000 um, for replacement. We started to purchase staff devices for laptops, which have been aging out and breaking down. Some of them are 10 years old. So we're going to need an ongoing allotment to, to ensure that we have the, the funding to, to upkeep these devices for both students and staff, in some cases the classroom Chromebook carts that are spread throughout the schools as well. We need to make sure we have the funding available. Um, we, we, okay, our vision is to kind of shift the one-to-one the -one initiative, which is so embedded as part of our curriculum where we acquire the seventh grade new devices and so forth as part of our operating budget. But we need an ongoing allotment for, for large capital for replacement. Um, the second is kind of a, a continuation of what we look to, um, to, to do in fiscal 21, but technology was deferred as part of the, the, the town and school capital plan. As the town only looked at the most pertinent kind of facility related school safety, um, you know, general safety, um, emergency related facility and, and building uh, projects. Um, but we still believe that there's a need for this $45,000 allotment to replace instructional classroom equipment, um, mainly smart boards that are in the three elementary schools that are past their useful life. Most of those were repurposed classrooms from the middle school to high school. 
they're breaking down, they need to be uh, replaced uh, in many cases, so they've gotten to, to just wear down it. We're now we're still using them, even though we're kind of hybrid. Um, they're still used every day. It's still a part of our, our curriculum and our, our, our instructional process with technology in the classroom. So we do need an allotment to, to um, replace these devices. This would have been the number one on the list had the plan gone forward as, as typical. This was the highest ranked product, uh, project um, through the CIPC this that past year. So we feel it's important to continue to ask for these, for these funds. Um, I think the ultimate vision is that we're going to pursue moving to like a one-fit-all interactive uh, board that kind of replaces the overhead projector, the smart board, and the teacher kind of press on on the desktop. We think we can go to an interactive board through an HDMI connection or even a Chromebook casting or mirroring uh, with the teacher's laptop to, to meet this need. I mean, we're only maintaining one piece of equipment um, and we, as we propose to maintaining and replacing the projector bulbs and the, the desktop uh, you know, pressed on in the classrooms as well as the smart board. So that's the vision that we would be exploring um, with some of this, certainly with some of the, the funding if approved. Mike, quick question. Yes. Um, is that because the technology has increased and we um, got with the, the smart board? Uh, yes, I think the technology has advanced, um, certainly, in the last few years, that the, the interactive you know, board, I think, is a lot it's more affordable now than maybe it was a few years ago, and I really think it just makes sense with the technology and your ability to kind of cast to that board and so forth has come to a point where we think that's kind of the next, you know, where we want to be in, in, in the future. Some of it might not be able to be done because this technology is just yeah. bleeding edge, just coming out right now, right? So some of it is still smart, is still a big player, that, so we might be able to do some smart board replacement early on. But then as it goes on, we are starting to look at these other systems that are that are kind of combining it into one. You know, it, right. It, it, it does look a little different in different ages as well for so what the needs are. Right. But so think of maybe having some piloting um, some classrooms with the new tech, newest technology um. in areas. Just out of pure curiosity, would you start maybe with the newer um, boards here at the high school, middle school, where the technology is a little bit more advanced, and then take the smart, smart boards here and move them to the um, elementary? Probably not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. And the smart boards in the elementaries are definitely most in need right now, and uh, these are still working fine. And it, we kind of built these here, just to be clear, too. I don't ever see us moving these out. Um, we can just start to replace things here to add on. So we like if you the boards at the middle high school are not interactive in, the, in and of themselves. Um, so the boards themselves wouldn't go anywhere. It's just it's not a it's not a smart board. They're not they're not touch. So the technology that that is used in that we can just replace it differently. Okay. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So a, a couple quick thoughts. I mean, number one, I know what you were just talking about. Like the more we can make it easier to to be able to teach the blind and people at home yep. better because, again, I think what we're learning is there, there might be something, this might be going on for a while and there might be something in the future world, I don't know, where we're gonna have to be able to work from home as well. Yeah. But my, my bigger question is just on the numbers. I don't think the numbers you're requesting are nearly enough. Right. I mean, they're not. They're not. <laughs> well, because, and I mean, this is about a third of what we would do. Uh, well, and that's how we pitched it for many years, is that we would do it in small chunks. It's at least $200,000 yeah. to do the upgrade of the elementary schools. That we need. So that's just, this is... It, even the device replacements, though, like, before, the whole idea was to have, what, 7th through 12th with devices? Yeah. I don't see us going away from K through 12 having devices. You can't expect that when a kindergartner gets a device that they can use it from K through 12. Yeah. So there's going to have to be two sets of devices. So as I see it, you're going to have to be buying devices for kindergartners or first graders, and then you're going to have to be buying them again for seventh graders. So every year you're going to have two sets of Chromebooks that are going to have to be purchased for two grade levels, and then the replacements of the ones you know that that happen along the way. And I, I just yeah. I just think it's not nearly enough. Not yeah, but this is right. next, and this doesn't cover that. Yeah, this is this right. is only covering the classroom test. So right. there's, there's another item that I think might be coming up that, that talks more of the student device. But you're absolutely right. From a general point, so we you know 
doubled the, the staffing also. I mean, we talk about taxing out our teachers and our, we did add a technician, which is great. We have some, but yeah. those positions need to carry on in the budget beyond the COVID yeah. piece because we're not just going to all of a sudden next year, you know, all the good things that we've learned from, you know, having younger kids using devices and all that we will do, we're not just going to say, oh, we're not going to do that. Right. right. So we're going to need to support all of that yeah. in our class. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. I think we've been able to acquire quickly because of some of the federal funding that's there. So I, we, we definitely feel like we need an ongoing amount. It's not going to be in the operating budget. It's been in the capital, through the cap, large capital process generally. And, but I think if your point is good, I don't know if the amount allotted here long term is going to be enough given the amount of devices we have. I don't think if it's not going to be another source. Um, if we're not going to be able to get funding kind of into our operating budget um, in some ways to assist. But we definitely need an, an allotment of money through this process right now through CITC. Um, the $60,000 has been the amount that uh, has kind of gone in support through that process. Um, but that was 7 through 12. And so I, I honestly don't think it's nearly enough. I think we need to say the 60,000 number that CIPC is used to hearing is for 7 through 12. We're talking about K through 12 now having devices. And so we need, I, I don't think we can, I don't think we can do it. Like, I mean, the operating budget is going to have to support some of this. And there's going to be some from CIPC, hopefully, but yeah, I don't think we're requesting nearly enough for all the yeah, I mean, all the stuff we're going to have to do. So to, to say that another way, if we're going to be giving, so up to now it's been a project to try to get everything up to speed. Now it's like giving them a book, right? It's like we we don't go to the CIPC for books. We we buy them as part of the budget. I, yeah. So I'm, I, I, we got to figure out how to get that into the. Yeah, I mean, I think we've always tried to find that balance. Yeah. I think certainly next year, because then we, the most of the devices that we've acquired um, are going to be new. Right. And, you know, I, but I think in the future, as we revisit this in the end of the year. Right, so, um, so your, 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 your fifth and sixth graders that, or I guess, so we bought them for fifth and sixth grade this year, right? As well as everybody else, but they won't need to be given new ones for seventh grade. No. So, right. so there is some time right. for raising stuff, time. but yeah. the long-term plan so no. clearly has to be. Yeah, this sixty thousand supported about one new grade per year. Yeah. What Scott's saying is correct. That if we were to say it's a huge stretch to say that we're going to get five to six years out of a promo, yeah. the life is around four. Yeah. We've definitely had more success than that, and I'm hoping with new generations. But even if you said six, you're at least doubling that now. So it's, it's at least one hundred and twenty to, to replenish. Yeah. The kindergartners when they get the sixth grade and the sixth graders, right. the seventh yeah. graders to get the we we plan on having sixty in the operating budget. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you need to you need to place the order now. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. The companies are still waiting to come in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite honestly, we're going to place it now for six years from now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but the fall. But the point is well taken. I think I think there's you know I think we do need to be one to one, K through twelve, yeah. and we need to make sure that the devices are working. And that we have this plan. We can't do it all in the operating budget. That's something we need to start communicating mm -hmm. by the line. And but, yeah, but, just in the community with it. But the one thing the one thing I would push back on though is I don't see this quite as like like textbooks. Because the CIPC is there to look at infrastructure and building stuff. And technology is a big one. A lot all the other departments in North Reading do the same thing. Their technology, like again, it's not built in to replace the computers every five or six years to their annual budgets. It's built into the CIPC budget that when their computers get old, they get replaced. So every computer in this district gets replaced, usually through CIPC, because it's a it's a long-term thing that the annual budgets do not support. And so, again, we've been able to do that. And I, and I hear you, and we have to find that balance here. My only point is, if right now we're talking about buying for one grade, I think we need to double that. I think it needs to be buying for two grades, because now we're we're not doing seven to twelve. So I guess my question. I guess my question is: Is is the CIPC and the financial planning team sort of this? Is, do we need to do? Do we need? Do we need to start uh, asking these questions there mm -hmm. and saying this yeah, is not a, you know the 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 one to one initiative, which was was seven to twelve and now one to uh, K to twelve, is not 
you know, a seven-year project and then we're done. This is, we, this is gonna, we're gonna be here every year for this. Yeah. And, and that's not typical of CIPC requests, as I understand. So, and that's fine yeah. if that's the best way to keep doing it, but it's, it's yeah. we don't want to all of a sudden them saying, well, we gave you yeah. 50,000 last year, yeah, so we don't want to do this year. We certainly need an amount. It's not too different than the tower has received 35,000 in computer device replacement on an ongoing basis. It, that's been supported by right. the CIPC. So we're at least kind of double that, and that because of what's gone on, and we have so many more devices. I think once the dust cleared, we'll see what happens to the operating budget. I think we have. To, I think we may need more, and I, I think it's true. I think the dust might have to be adjusted, but not this year, down the road. And it's one thing to replace staff devices, and, and to look at you know it's, it's double the amount, but we have more than double the staff. But now just. Forget about the staff number. Now you're adding 2,500 students on top of that. So it's just there's, yeah, there's just a lot more to make. Yeah, I think it's I think it is a balance. Trying to you know I think we have to support it. And the question becomes at the financial planning level, like moving forward, are these things where, where, where do they fall and who do they fall into? And it's not it's not something that we can just cut something else from our budget to support right. it. I think that's, that's, that's yeah important. for sure. And I that and that's probably one of the reasons why you react yeah. so strongly. I'm not suggesting that we all of a sudden move it into the budget and then we have to find, find room for it, but we just have to make it as a town, as a planning process. Well, it's, it's, it's a good it's, point. I mean, the, the other part of that is that, like, as as a town, I mean, I'm, I don't know that every town, I don't, I've totally been in North Rutgers, right. I don't know if every town does it like this. Some towns might allocate more to the schools, and then the schools can build in capital projects. But these are the questions we're going to have to Yeah, whereas what we have done in North Reading a lot of times is we try to take some of the capital projects separate and have a group throughout the town have a certain amount of money, a certain amount of funding to allocate towards that. And all I'm saying right now is for you know device replacement, replacement, things like that, the last few years we've talked about things, the assumption has been on 7 through 12. I, I think the assumption going forward is K through 12. Even if everybody's back in school full time next year, the learning is going to be different. We're going to develop different models. Like I see my second grader at home using her Chromebook, and you know, in a way, it's like it's sad that she's not at school. But there's all, it's also pretty amazing that she is pretty is becoming pretty good with a Chromebook, and she don't want to like. And I'm not going to go back to third grade and stop using it. Yeah, so. And those devices are also getting used more than they've ever been used before. Right. right? They would have been brought out for. For a half hour lesson for typing or something. Now they're being used all day, every day. Cameras, microphones, so many more things that can, can go wrong when they're getting used that much. So it's really that replacement cost that we think about a lot as well. And just to, just to be clear, and I, I know this has been established, but we, it was said a few meetings ago that you don't need the smart boards as much as all about the Chromebooks, but it's absolutely it's in hybrid, and I've seen it every day that I've gone in. It's essential that, that you have both because if you're fully remote, the smart board is not as important. But when you're in the class every day, the kids are watching that smart board in class and at home, and it's it's uh, it's really an incredible tool which is in some ways being used more now than even yeah. when we're fully in person. And so, let's go, and so let's go back to that because that's where we yeah. started, right? Was with the smart board allocation, and and uh, you know it, it certainly is critical, and you guys talked about this already, but that you know what the future of the technology is that we get a handle on that as soon as possible, so mm -hmm. that so that we're not spending more time buying. The smart technology, which may or may not be the best for the future in every school. Yep, I never love And I withdraw my comment from two weeks ago, Patrick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I just wanted to make fired. Fired. Oh, what? I'm not fired. <laughs> I think the advocacy, but I think the, the awareness of the folks on CIPC and private clients, you need to understand that, that we're in a different situation. Happy to come take a visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, somehow for, for a video visit. I know. Virtually. <laughs> okay, so that is kind of technology. Right, right, so some more to kind of think about there. Appreciate the certainly the great feedback. I, I do think for this year we should think about that honestly when we're when our when we're putting our initial request in. I think we should think about the go to K through twelve and you know maybe when we come back have a higher amount for that one personal. Okay. Well, go Definitely. Okay. Um, so the, um, next is going to talk about vehicle requests. We have two vehicles requests for the focus on fiscal 22. So this this was kind of in the plan as, as um, that was put together and, and to consider a second multifunction vehicle acquisition. Um, as you may recall, we did purchase um, one a couple years ago. We 
kind of had the ability to utilize that for about a little over a year and a half. We have seen us certainly save significantly in our transportation costs for athletics, certainly used elsewhere, extracurricular. I know uh, performing arts programs have used it you know, numerous times. We definitely have a need for a second vehicle. I, I think that's certainly clear. I think if we had a second vehicle, we're now going to be able to put more teams, more runs that are just a little bit larger, mm -hmm. larger teams, you know, basketball, and a variety of more teams allows us to have that much more ability to take um, more transportation runs, more in-house, in and really even um, experience a greater level of savings. So we've kind of found that there's a sweet spot for every vehicle that could be between 40 and 50 runs would get transferred from outside contractors to in-house, which we're on average paying about $300, in some cases a little bit more. Again, this is a bid year. Those costs could go up next year. Um, with the, the athletic and extracurricular transportation, we think that ranges between 12 and you know 14, maybe on the high end, 15 thousand dollars a year with each vehicle that's purchased. So the payback is very small. We're looking at a less than you know four-year payback. Um, we'd be willing to take the approach with CIPC, which I think they liked the second time we went for this vehicle, is that we would take that year one savings and offset it, um, and then from there on we experience the full savings. Uh, which would mean the cost of this vehicle has really gone up to about fifty-five thousand. Four or five years ago, I think we were hoping it might be forty-five, but it really is. It, it was it's really about fifty-five thousand right now. So we could take take that amount and only request forty thousand dollars with one approach, which they sort of liked. Um, it did help us get the support and I think get this project over the hump a couple of years ago. But I've talked to um, athletic director Dave Johnson, and we definitely feel like a second vehicle would be certainly helpful. I've talked to Alex and Kane about it. I've talked to the folks on North Reading Hornets production, and I, I think they, they feel um, you know, two vehicles are needed. So um, this request is kind of on the table for fiscal 22. Chris? Uh, Michael, yeah. um, how has COVID kind of affected the usage? Of right, our so it certainly it has impacted it on the number of ridership. Yeah. So right now we're, we're still following the one student per per seat. Right. So there's only about seven students riding on on this vehicle. So the golf team has used this vehicle this fall. They normally would use this, and that would be all they're using. Yeah. Uh, they're actually using this vehicle now in the backup spare special education van because um, they want they generally want to transport about ten ten. Um, athletes to a competition. So they have been doing that. Um, and believe it or not, we've actually been using a, a uh, second shift custodian that has a 7D license and all, and to also help transport uh, this year with the athletic event. So it's been, it's been the coach driving this vehicle and the second shift that takes about an hour off is, you know, he leaves the high school, middle school for an hour and drives and comes back, works. And then goes back, picks up if he has to, um, and that's allowed us to do that. And the chair, but Michael, if, uh, is, it, is it fair to say that if we did have this, we really would have had challenges to have the support of the games? Yeah, I think. I mean, I see it even with COVID more than ever. I think we just like having that flexibility of, the, of us having the <laughs> control of that transportation um, with the, the, the team and the coaching staff can kind of follow their own schedule, but not at the mercy of. Um, the contractor that may have to fill it, finish an elementary run that has limited drivers. There's not a lot of um, bus companies right now that have the ability to have separate charter drivers. So you, what, you, what you're looking at is you're looking at a driver that has to finish, in some cases, an elementary run. I know we kind of swapped that this year, but in some, some cases, an elementary run, and then get back to the high school or finish that a late high school run or middle school run and get back. So they're kind of waiting at the school, and it's a challenge. Um, because it's just a shortage of, of quality bus drivers that companies are faced with. So having that flexibility, um, I think for a lot of these teams, the two two really kind of put us over the edge that we can now do varsity and JV basketball team throughout the winter and, and a variety of things that have been challenging. Thank you. And I think it's a good idea. I think with this and the next vehicle, you have a payback in about five years. I think it's a no-brainer to consider. I hope that we agree. Yeah. So, 
the next vehicle is here. So we, we are kind of revisiting our request for a, a toolcat. Um, as you know, uh, Sonny Campagna, Director of Facilities, has now been with the district um, since the middle of August. So we've been here about three months, had a chance to kind of review and see, see the operation and make some good recommendations. He continues to kind of get familiarize himself with the district. And he's, I think he's doing a really great job. Um, and believe it or not, first thing he said to me when I'm looking over the plan, we're making adjustments to it, and he, you know, fresh set of eyes to the plan. He said, you know, why, why don't we have one of these vehicles? I gave him a history of that we, we tried to make one of these vehicles, uh, didn't get support for two or three years, so we kind of took, we kind of took it off the list. Uh, we actually, believe it or not, were told that we would eventually get one through the FF&E of this campus. Never ended up happening, but we kind of originally thought that that might be the case. Through the FF and E budget, the money that might be left at the end. So that did not happen. But we feel, and from what he's looked at, that having access to this type of a vehicle for sweeping, obviously snow plowing, front front loading with grounds, facilities, obviously snow removal at this campus, landscaping needs, we think we can save significantly amount, not only on manpower with overtime costs coming down. With, right now, we're using, we have four or five guys using the push snowblower, doing the sidewalks, going all the way down that stretch, down the hill, and, and up and all around this campus. That could be done in half the time with a, with a vehicle, with one guy um, with a vehicle like this. So, and then just even with the ground and, and the sweeping and different things that we're doing, we think this would be a significant upgrade of efficiency and cost savings to our operation. We're willing to share it with the town. Certainly, the DPW have access to it in the time. We've offered that. I'm willing to do that as well. But again, it turns we think it's less than four years um, as well. So, they're actually a pretty helpful video. Like, I don't know if you guys want me to share it. You don't need to do that. You're watching your own time. But there's a good, helpful two minute video link there. My only other comment here is if for some reason this can't be funded, this was one that I was wondering, should we even consider trying to get it ourselves? Because it's so many yeah. hours that we're talking about I here. Like, I, I, yeah, I think they're, I'm, I'll answer that in saying yes right now. I mean, we, we, we came close to doing that. Uh, we actually released a used one for a year, for six months. Um, and it was great having that. Uh, it was a very old one with a lot of engine hours and man hours. So it, it wasn't worth it to invest in it. Or to buy out the lease would have been 30, 35,000 to buy out at the time. But we just wanted to experiment with it. Say, so we had it for four or five months and it was great, and it, but it was clearly it had hours on it. Um, but I mean, they can be leased and we can pursue that. Um, but it would be great if we could get the support so we get the savings right from the beginning. Yeah, I, mean, I just, I just think for the, I mean, we're asking our custodians to do so much right now, and we need them in the school. There's so much extra cleaning that is needed. That if we could support them, like when winter months come, and they can, yep. it'll be so much quicker for them. If, I agree. You know, to do it, I. So we we've gotten some additional grounds assistance, and we, and uh, we actually feel like if we had this vehicle, we could now have the we have the manpower to put to um, to go one individual that could be in this vehicle doing the sidewalks, doing all those areas, and then we could have the access to now two. Two or three plowers, we could eliminate all of our outside contractors for plowing, um, which we which we currently we do contract out with some of the towns bidding through the bidding process. Some of the town plowers, um, you know, Warren Pierce and Smith and Sons that do some of our other other schools. We feel like we could phase almost all of that out, which would be a significant savings. I mean, this, we think this is actually conservative savings by us yeah. for this game. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. I think we should think about that even for our budgeting for this year because I mean, just the time, the, the amount of hours we're talking about, we're talking about other positions potentially to, to be able to do some of these things that like if we could do it, you know, five times quicker by having the proper equipment, it's, you know, I, I, and I don't know the timeline of CITC versus what we're, when we're doing our budget, but this is the one vehicle that when I was looking through the presentation, I was, I was thinking we we probably need that as opposed to want that. Yeah, I think, and, and as Michael said, having Mr. Kabai come in, it's almost like we did an audit. Right? You have somebody new come in, fresh set of eyes, we didn't lead them in any way, and this is one of the conclusions he jumped right to. So. Right. Right. <clears throat> Michael, what's the estimate for lifespan? So, yeah, this should last, 
at, at least 12 years. I think with good, good maintenance, if you generally yeah. get in service, you can get 15 years, potentially. So, I mean, effectively, if we got this 15 years ago, we'd have saved like $200,000. Yeah. 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 So just some future items in mind. Uh, that we, we're actually, our special education fleet, we have four vehicles, three are in operation daily, one's a back office or a spare. We're actually in pretty good shape here. Um, we do have our spare, which is a 2011, has about 103,000 miles on it. So something that we just will monitor, but it could be something we want to consider replacing um, in the next year or two. Um, we've been able to kind of extend the life of some of our stairs a little bit longer than, than 12 or 13 years. Um, but something to, something to kind of consider in our mind that we put the plan. Um, we're going to touch last last category, facilities. So we're looking at really quick kind of a three-year outlook snapshot. Uh, the Little School has a couple projects that is the focus for fiscal 22. Um, little School parking lot has been deferred a couple of years. We really feel like that now needs to get done. Um, you know, we're gonna go, it's going to go through another winter, and we, we really want to uh, push for that one hard for fiscal 22. The Little School fascia and soffits are, are, are certainly deteriorating and decaying. It, it needs to, uh, we're actually waiting for the final proposal for that. That's one thing. Been a couple companies that have come out, so that's an our budget figure in there is an estimate. So that by hopefully by the time we're next together, I might have an actual figure. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. And then there's some other items you can see in the in the three-year outlook. Uh, but certainly the paving projects kind of revisited from prior years. You can kind of look at some of the data here, but it's certainly we feel like that that needs to be the priority for next year. Hundred thousand dollars would get get the job done. Also expand some parking spaces at, at the school for that gravel area where the old playground used to be. Um, we have talked about this project, also including kind of a study to see if we can improve that front loop and the drop off area. So that if approved, we can try to certainly revisit that conversation in that project as well. Um, this is something that's new again. This is a recommendation by Mr. Campagna who came and looked at things. Uh, we had. We've had this on a small capital request for the last couple of years, and it um, hadn't gotten funded, but we thought we could, we knew we had to make some needed repairs, small, I mean, thinking small, four or $5,000, but we think there's a lot of areas um, that need to be addressed um, to certainly uh, address some of the, the decay, as you see in some of these photos uh, throughout the, the, fa the fascia and the softness of the school. <coughs> Um, so we're waiting on a final proposal. We think it might be less than fifty thousand dollars, but certainly right now, a quick estimate somewhere between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars that we would be needed to address all the areas. Um, and certainly, the solution would be a solution designed to increase the life expectancy. Something that might be kind of a, a wood alternative, still pr protect the aesthetics of the, the building, but um, certainly provide extra kind of covering and durability. Um, to extend that life. Yeah, I was kind of, kind of confused by the by the description of a wood product wrapped in vinyl. Um, yeah, um, I mean it would make sense to do a uh, uh, like a, a vinyl product, right? Like replicated wood. Right. That yeah. Makes sense. So I think that might be more what uh, yeah. what we might be looking at. I know word of that right, but I think yeah, I think we're looking at sort of a wood alternative kind of vinyl product yep. for enhanced durability. I think in some areas. Um, a couple of companies that came out, you certainly said they would, you know, look to certainly. You know, I think you, I think you referenced, you know, putting kind of a a metal kind of interior um, barrier there for you know for for weathering and, and so forth. Yeah. But we would make sure we certainly selected the right solution. Michael, just, just two quick comments on the, on the little school paving project. Yeah. I also think that this year's even. I think it changes a little bit where every door is being used now. You have, you know, first and second graders walking across the parking lot that people are driving in to try to get to their classroom door because it's not all the central, you know, the front off the front door anymore. So you literally have tons of kids just walking across the parking lot while people are trying to come in and 
park in it right now. It, it's just, it's a mess. And there's like areas that are torn up from where the playground was before. And I just think that even more so this year, because every door is in use. Right. It's, Good point. it's concerning. Um, and then the, the second question is, do we need anything more? Like you mentioned the security of this building, because uh, a couple of doors are being used. What about all the other school buildings? Because I know the other schools are also using different doors now. It always used to be one yeah. main door. Um, do we need to look at any security at, like even if it's just better lock, I mean, do we need to do anything different at the security at different scale? Good schools? question. I'll certainly follow up and check into it. I, I think because we did the security upgrades with video cameras, I think we got all those areas. We did a pretty thorough walkthrough with the fire and the police and stuff. They didn't note any areas of um, that they were not seeing or any, any area that was a concern to them. Um, I'll confirm that um, with the police department and with the folks that were involved in that section. But is that, does that make sense? Yes, yeah. yes, I'll agree with that, Mr. Connelly. Um, the police department is, is who brought to our attention the doors here yeah. um, based upon plans that they were aware of and what was covered and what was visible. We can definitely revisit as well, but the reports that we had initially were the, the issue that they had was here. That's why we moved in that direction. That's a great point as well. Okay. I had a question about the paving project. Uh, we're, the hundred thousand dollar amount. Um, yeah, how long has that been there, and does it need to be? Yeah, so I think uh, it's only been around for well less than a year, um, and I think we're using about two dollars and fifteen, two fifteen per square foot. When we started this, we we're at as low as dollar eighty five, and we even added some contingency on top of that. So we we think it's a good number. Uh, but it's a good question. Yeah, and it feels like, I mean, we don't really have a, a quote unquote design for like if we were to repave the loop, would it change anything? Or is mm -hmm. it, it's right. just assuming at the moment just straight paving, but uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be fine. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not there enough, but uh, sometimes when you start these things, it's like, oh, yeah, you got to, we, we need to do curbs or. or yeah. I mean, this has been looked at quite a, quite a bit. I think we started it with about. Seven thousand, and it's it's gradually. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I know you might have cost has gone up, and it's gotten expanded a little bit because of the coming through curbing and so forth. Mr. Bernard has mentioned that like there was going to be a change to the design. Yeah. They were going to be going in more because there's going to be a drop off in the back of the building where the preschool is being dropped off. Right. Because I think that was one of the concerns, mm -hmm. and that was, was that you can that. only you can only fit like six cars in the actual. Where they do the drop off here. Yeah. It's a very tight little area there. I think they were going to have it go through and then have a separate that drop off. That was one idea. Yeah. Yeah. That I remember being part of that for, for one level and then go around the, the other time. one. The time the town, that's actually the town engineer and the DPW at the time and had kind of involved and kind of told us they would do part of that design work. Right, right. right. Which was saving and hiring sort of a third party. Right. But you can certainly look into that as well. Okay, um, so moving on to some of the future projects. Um, certainly the, the, the Hood School modular demo removal that's been in there a couple of years, we've been able to keep that unit, those units in good, in good shape to kind of continue to kind of defer this project. But at some point, um, it's gonna to have to be revisited. The bachelor school rooftop units, some of those are starting to have some costly repairs. So we think we need a plan to start addressing some of these six rooftop units. Um, right now, we're, we've gotten them in good working, working order, but I think just to continue to kind of assess and revisit as we look at the plan. I talked about some of the middle uh, school mods and the, the roof restoration and the borders of the hood. Um, energy management system, that's, we'd love to be able to fully upgrade that system uh, at the hood and the little to include the entire building. Right now, it's boiler room only. Um, it is costly, but it's something we would really allow us to really fine tune and regulate those buildings that even be greater than what, what we've been able to do. Similar to how we've been able to, to work this building and batch. Um, so, just another outlook of some of the facility related projects that are included in the plan. Again, it's, it's certainly heavy, heavily focused on the on the elementary schools, with this school certainly being the newest, newest building. 
We're going to continue to explore um, energy efficiency measures, certainly so solar. It's continuing to work with RMLD on what solar could look like and waiting for information from them on their RFI that they submitted. Supposed to get information about a week ago. I have not gotten that yet. I reached out to them this week about it. Um, so all, all things are part of the plan. In terms of the process, so we're looking for school committee feedback and approval this month and next in November. Um, requests are being told are going to be due at the end of November to the CIPC this year, which is a little bit delayed by about six, seven weeks. CIPC would then restart your meeting in November and December. Uh, they would look to, I believe, finalize their rankings um, sometime at the end of March, beginning of April, and then I think that presentation goes in front of the select board um, towards the middle of April, and then obviously town meeting too. So, any other questions? My only other thought was, I say this every year, but the demolition of space, we need all the space we can get right now. Right. I'd be a little bit concerned with removing any units, even if they're not yeah. there right now. So you know what so you, Right. So we, you know, we would actually take over the, the scene classrooms. Yeah. Um, so we would we actually would lose some rental revenue. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very good point. We would there would be one classroom that we would we would lose. Um because it would be a, a swap. It's, it's four mm -hmm. modular classrooms in this three yeah. scene class seat scene. And team is in that the mods right now offer occupying yeah. two of those units in the mods right now. And so why is it that you're we're going to replace the little school modular, but not the the not study the that we've already been a part of. Now again, we can revisit it, but the, the little school with the with that being probably where the the early childhood and the pre K program is housed, and looking at what the needs are, um, and there's. There's no rental in the room. We didn't think it was at all possible for us to lose that space and not not be able to replace it. Um, we don't know where we put the pre-K, for example, and the in that those those classrooms being utilized um, because we thought it was more possible. We always thought it was more possible to put because we did have some swing space with use of the the maker space room and the library and a variety of different things we could do. The maker space could move to the same areas of the library at a time, and the fact that there was three rooms that we were renting, uh, we felt we potentially could save a, a huge amount of money with you know four modular units. We cost the town you know a million dollars, a significant amount of money, um, by by not going that direction. I, I know that one of the thoughts was, on, and Dr. Daly has mentioned before about like if we're going to address the full day kindergarten cost and early child care development. Some of the ideas involve having space to do things with. And I just again, I just wonder if with the if with the plan that you're going to talk about with 2025 plan, if you know the that's going to be part of it and talking about space would be part of it that would lead into this discussion in any way. I just, it definitely is something that we've talked about. I just don't know that the mods or that space just based on their useful life. Yeah. Well, or or a replacement being something where it could be. Right. I think the, I think yeah. what you're asking is should we should we be demolishing and replacing, not demolishing yeah. the hood? Yeah. I mean, we can revisit that. I mean, we kind of <laughs> we've gotten those mods in a good. You know, a couple of years ago we were thinking, you know, the time might be coming. Um, you know, we've got we've been able to, to do some repairs and address some of the issues uh, to expand the life of the, those units. So um, fortunately we've been able to kind of keep moving it out a year or two years as we reassess each each summer and and, and we've been able to salvage but then it's really not gonna last forever. Yeah. You know, we've gotten to that point. We can we can revisit that compensation. Or even an addition as opposed to not I again I don't know maybe the addition is a lot more expensive but yeah. I think this town here needs, there's a lot of things that people are discussing that are needed um, that go even beyond just the schools. And so maybe there's a way to combine some of those things into a project that adds on to the school or uses another piece of land. Or I mean, certainly could see, could see expanding uh, that program, combining early childhood with, say, you know, it's, it's a long term investment that would centralize some of that. I think some of the things we've done. This year, because of COVID, with with allowing you know 
access for employees to have children with child care. It's just, these, are, these are positive things that we can continue to build on. And there's ways to combine, you know, I've seen a lot of towns successfully combine early childhood and senior support, you know. So those are two needs for this town. And maybe there's a way to continue to think about that. And I think those are conversations for this committee and for, for others with the town. I know there's a lot of projects out there that we need to see what we can do. So. It's a good thought, though. Yeah, good. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi. Oh, wait, you're all looking at me, aren't you? Next, Superintendent's goal, Dr. Daly. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen again in a moment, but um, what I'm sharing tonight are my goals for the 2020-21 school year. Um, as you know, I, I completed my, my first year last year through January through July with my first set of goals. Um, it was a little bit different over the summer um, than we had planned. And then we were able to um, come back together here in the fall with the new set of goals for this year. So I was able to meet with the evaluation subcommittee and I proposed those goals. And then tonight I'm hoping to um, to share my final goals for approval. The, the plan, I don't have uh, in the packet the, the overall schedule, but I, I can summarize that as being uh, that the goals would go from this fall and they would be done by this June. So it would be this school year's plan. And my reason really for doing this tonight was to get out ahead. I want to model my goals um, ahead of what everyone else is doing in the district. So I'm very happy that we have um, the process for educator evaluation for our administrators and for our, uh, for our teachers this year. And I think it's also very good that we have uh, our, you know, template that I'm using is the same model. So it's going to look a little different to you possibly than what you've seen in the past. I'm trying to use the updated Department of Ed templates. I'm trying to model with my goals, what you're seeing with the administrator goals, what you're seeing with the teacher goals, I'm trying to have some alignment between uh, the school committee goals, the district improvement plan that you know we're still operating under NRPS 2021, but where there's certainly some changes with the addition of equity and other pieces we talked about within our PS 2025. I'm trying to get these out tonight so that our administrators will have their goals ready to go. So that on November 3rd, when we meet with all the teachers who are setting up their goals, they can model theirs after, after what we've set up. Uh, so I'm I share them with you in the packet. I'm attempting to put this on the screen. And there's so many pieces here to come up. But are there any questions about the goals that I have? Do you want me to go through them or what would you like to do? You can uh, clarify the date again that this evaluation is for September 20 to June 2021. Yep, so okay. be, this is year two of, of a one year plan, and then there'll be a third one year plan. That would be the goal. And I, I would ask the subcommittee first, I mean, if they have any specific thoughts on this compared to last year, how it looks. And... Uh, we shared some feedback from Dr. Daly at the time, but uh, really, overwhelmingly that these are great goals that uh, the concept of trying to align vertically from the top all the way down to the teachers I think is uh, a, a very smart move for the region and yeah I mean I kind of thought this would be a time for you guys to share any any extra feedback that you uh, might have one thing I'll, I'll ask Dr. Dale is pretty inconsequential but this document you've Put into this, uh, it's not an official document at all. Or it, there's a couple of little errors in it that you might want. To... Absolutely. You have the, the end date listed as June 2020, not 21. That was my yeah, the clear. And then uh, I think out of habit at the end when you signed it, you signed the evaluator line instead of the. Oh uh... Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm the I'm the. Uh, <laughs> the one time I get to be the educator, right? <coughs> Yeah, no, that's that's all. It's all a work in progress. Right, right, right. But the, the goals are the draft. The goals are what this is about. The goals are, are, are right where they should be. Um, I'll I'll call one thing out that um, that came up during subcommittee meeting that I think you guys should should have your attention drawn to, which is that uh, Dr. Daly 
he does it in the first poll here. Is he's listed the um, the the criteria for excellence. Exemplary, excuse me, for exemplary, and uh, and that's something that I think is just a, a, a terrific idea to model. That uh, the goal is to be exemplary, and, and you know we're going to be evaluating him to make sure that that he's proficient and hopefully exemplary. But uh, that's one element I thought is just a, and it wasn't even a goal. It's just it's just a good idea, uh, a good practice to, to kind of have that trust and evaluation, and also uh, be shooting for the the, the top mark. I took the advice of the committee from last year and definitely pulled back the focus. I have many less indicators, um, still representative of the full rubric. Um, and I did a student learning goal as well as a professional practice goal and in addition four district goals, similar, similar to last year, but a real focus on specific indicators that are aligned closely with the goals. They certainly build on the goals from last year. Um, similar to what the teachers are doing, I wanted to have one goal that was related to uh, social justice. I wanted to have one goal that was related to um, the hybrid teaching and learning, and they're a little bit more indirect in this way um, than, than perhaps the teachers will be. There is a piece of this uh, document as well that I'm still uh, working on where we identify student learning measures and anticipated student learning gains. And what I thought the subcommittee pointed out that I thought was a great idea was uh, because my Student learning connections are indirect. I will have student learning measures and also student learning gains, but then I'll include administrator learning measures and administrator learning gains. What do I hope that my administrative team is able to benefit from my goals? Um, and then similarly, indirectly, how students, and then to model that with the administrators, where they'll think how do my teachers and staff benefit directly from my goals and how do students indirectly benefit? I think that was a great suggestion because just having to answer those questions helps us always get back on focus for why am I doing this goal. Yes, it's to improve my my professional growth as an administrator, but it's also to directly impact these folks and indirectly always going back to students. Uh, and then that helps to carry the through line to the teachers who, when they make their goals, it always needs to be connected to what, what is it going to be for the students that are in the class, which I think is great. So again, by using the same exact form and by following that model, I think that will be very helpful. So um, this does, yeah, as mentioned, this was a draft that I'm just getting approved tonight, but it continues to be a living document that's going to be shared. So my goal is to get this all ready to go so it can be shared out as a model for the administrators we're meeting next week um, to polish those, to get ready for our November 3rd PE day when we're going to spend uh, a significant amount of time with our teachers doing at eval. And again, not the paperwork part of at eval, but the point of all of us as educators this year are grappling with these two goals. And eval is a great framework for accountability to make sure that we're all doing what we need to do. Um, and so I think that that will that will be well received and time well spent for those folks. So my couple of thoughts and questions and comments, and, and to be perfectly transparent, evaluation is my weakest part of being a school committee member, to be honest. Like I haven't been on the subcommittee. It, these rubrics are overwhelming to me, not how, what I see in, in, in my general general day. Um, I, I notice the fewer you know goals and, and fewer indicators, which I appreciate. Um, that was the first thing I noticed. Two quick questions. Number one, on the goals, some of them say individual, some of them, some of them say team. Yep. Wouldn't there be sort of a, an individual component as to each of them and the team component? Or like, why is it one or the other? Sure. There, there is. Um, that's something that I really wanted. To, I, I've always felt a little disconnected from the superintendent schools as, a, as an administrator. And so I wanted to really model. Um, I've, I'm asking all of my administrators that are at the administrative council levels, the principals and the directors, to have six goals, which that has not always been the case. But I also don't want to overburden them with this. So I'm saying those goals are already in your school improvement plan or their team goals that we're working on together. So I, I'm hoping to see a lot of their goals a part of my team because we are a team. So as I'm as I'm working on my goal, we're actually all doing this stuff together. And then they're also working on some of their goals as a team. So I think a lot of the goals are team goals, but some of them um, you can't think of them as more individual. This is something that I'm doing personally to to grow. And so I agree that there's an individual aspect of every team goal, there's a team aspect of every individual goal. We can't 
do any of this on our own. Uh, and so sometimes you kind of go back and forth. But team is usually going to indicate that somebody else has that as a goal as opposed to just they're a part of it. You know, Mike, I, mean, I have a goal in here that I'm not going to do without Michael's help, right? But it might not necessarily be Michael's goal. So that's why it's not a team, if that makes sense. So the team is usually going to indicate that most likely there's somebody else with a very similar goal. Right. So and and available, not just as we need to do this in order to do our job. But it's still fair to evaluate you as an individual on a team goal. It is. And that's 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 built into our system. It's actually encouraged pretty strongly to have individual and team goals for the teachers. So I think it's good to model that all the way up. Um, so, but again, I think these, as far as being a superintendent, I would say that these, uh, you know, I, I'm i accountable for whether these team goals get, that's getting it. So don't, there's there's no loss of accountability with that. And then, and then on district goal number one, it just doesn't have any focus indicators or elements. The, uh, they, they on focus indicators or elements. Like all the other ones referenced different folks. They, they all they all will. Yeah. As I said before, like I, I wanted to get this okay. tonight because I wanted to get out ahead of next Thursday, ahead of next uh, November fifth. If if I were doing this to give you something polished, I would not be giving you this till November fifth, but that's after the P D day, so I'm trying to just get the best I can. So I apologize for being in slightly in draft form. But um, it is a Google Doc and like so even what was set out in the packet has been updated since then. Okay. Uh, they, they all will have all of those components. No, I mean, look good in me. Other stuff? Diana? Yeah, it's great. Like, I could see that you took the feedback from last year and um, they made a lot of sense for me and seemed to be aligned with what you spoke about with the teachers as well. So the alignment, I think, is a great idea. <laughs> you know, the only other thing I've had on the COVID one, I mean, I, I have a feeling in a year we still will be dealing with at least the after math of it is not still COVID, but um, I mean, I think a lot of it's going to be how to implement like changes going forward, not just COVID, but like overall, I think that's going to be the transition. What we're going to learn from this is just like we were just talking about with, with Michael Connell, with Michael about, you know, where do we go after this? We had to, we had to have Chromebooks in order to get through this, but then how do we best use that? And so a lot of the COVID things I think are just, and more transition to the future teaching and learning. That's true. I, this did come up in the subcommittee as well about COVID. I just, I just feel as far as being transparent and publishing this on the website, I feel like I want to be able to show folks that COVID is our focus. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this is this year, and I want to show that our goal is that we're focused on it this year. Uh, but I think it's written to be broadly. So essentially, I updated our. Um, you know, the um, school safety goals from last year and incorporated the concept of COVID, but it's really all the processes, procedures, and protocols around safety through this umbrella lens of, of COVID, which is what we're up against this year, obviously. So, and I think it's, I think it's fair to say it's going to go through at least June. Then we'll be still talking about this. So. Well, and there's two parts to that. That, and also, as you say, Whatever trajectory we were on, COVID is changing that trajectory and changing the direction to some degree. And we're going to figure that, you know, part of what everything is going to be figuring that out. Your goals, our goals. Uh, Other comments? So you would like a, a vote to approve these, Dr. Daly? Is that correct? If you could. I mean, I could also say that I'll bring back the, the finalized version in a few weeks, but this is just a, it's essentially a concept that these are the goals for the year. I just want to have them in place so I can show them to the administrators and then to the okay. teachers. I have a motion on that. Look into my last. Sure. Uh, I move to the that way. I move to accept Dr. Daly's uh, what I phrase, uh, educator plan. Evaluation. Thank you very much. Uh, educator evaluation plan. Second. Okay. Roll call. Together, Chris? Ah, yeah. Aye. Diana? Aye. Rich? Aye. I'm an I as well, I is zero. You all? Okay, moving on, we have minutes next. On 
these ones on the minutes we're going to just to point out that some people were not there so if you're not there you should have stayed yes. um, well I'll make a motion to accept the October 5th executive session. Um, it doesn't state it, but uh, Ms. Butler was not there, present. Um, I don't know if it matters if it says that it's not there, if she, if she wasn't there in the minutes. In the executive session, though? Yeah, it just well, has the four yeah, of us. They dealt with it differently on the two different minutes. The executive session didn't have a list of the next right. said not present. Right. So yeah. I they didn't did know say that. it was a 4 of vote, uh, though, I think it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was right. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I, I think both are accurate. his point. I didn't know if it needed to be considered. Yeah. So. I can double check that with Ann. Okay. You can see, uh, <laughs> see that. That's a good point. Okay. So um, for the executive session of October 5th, as written, unless it needs to be amended to Acknowledge um, Ms. Butwell. I, I guess, but I forget how we're saying it. Anyway, to <laughs> approve the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll second. No. Okay. You've written a second. Um, one point of, of, of discussion also is <coughs> this was a meeting where some were in person and some were not in person. I don't know if the minutes should reflect. Yeah, that. I didn't think that was as pertinent as. <coughs> I don't know with with yeah. everything going on because I don't the know. Whole, the whole meeting is is being called virtual. Virtual. Okay. And we're just we just happen to be here. Okay. I, okay. You know, as far as public um, record, so I, okay. okay. So it's kind of virtual either way. So I think virtual. when we go back to normal and and if then we do allow <laughs> a member to to, to yeah. participate virtually, then we should specify. But I think here, as you say, we're all virtual. Correct. And, and, and again, because I do know that you should note it in a regular meeting if right. some are in person and somebody's yeah. remote. Yeah. So. Maybe we can amend. I mean, uh, let's take that out there, but that's it, it is in us. But it's technically posted as a virtual meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll do a roll call vote on that. So Janine. A. Chris. Aye. Rich. Aye. Diana. And I'll vote aye as well. So it passes four zero. Thank you. I make a motion to accept the open session minutes of October fifth as written. I second. Uh, any discussion? Say the exact same discussion as we just had about all those points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Uh, and I'm an aye as well. Pass the score zero. Thank you. Uh, budget update. Mr. Connolly, anything? Uh, no, I just need to. One question on budget. <laughs> Just a quick question, bus contract, when, when is that going to start the discussion? Because I know this is the year that we have to renegotiate the bus contract, correct? That's correct. So um, typically I would not send that out to, to bid until the beginning of December or so. Uh, bids would typically come in, we have to even doing it early. Uh, yeah. Bids would even come in January, mid January to the end of January. So we would have bid numbers and certainly in time for budget conversations picking up mid February to the end of the beginning of March. So that's that's simply the time frame. Just a question I was wondering. <laughs> I will say it on the so the one thing I did, I was gonna note during the opening, but I guess it's budget related as well. Um, we were happy to see that the uh, USDA extended the food service uh, free mail program um, to the end of the school year from December, which is which is great news. So um, we've got a couple of communications over the last seven or eight days or so in my office to families about food service. Um, and one this morning that clarified that it got extended to the end of the school year. So again, we are, we just. So we'd love to see families both learning remotely and students in remote learning, in person learning, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, we're definitely you know, ready to, to handle additional mail and, and meet that need. Um, I, very quickly, I analyzed some of the numbers from September to numbers through um, October 13th or so, or at the end of last week. Um, 
and our, our mails are up by about 10 percent in October that they were trending in September. Um, but I think we can, we can certainly do more and enhance the mail. We would see that certainly on the, the remote program as well. So a couple of communications have gone out, just confirming that. And I think families have seen that and asked questions to me even today about it. So hopefully we see some increasing participation. Does that pick up mostly in school lunches or, I mean, is there any pickup in the remote, just pick up? It's a little bit of all. It's a little bit of all. Definitely there's an in-school lunch, but also the remote program picked up as well. Okay. And you don't have to you don't have to order in advance for that. You can just show up yeah, that day. Yeah, order in advance. We started out just to get an idea of what the participation would be. We started the a Google form, but the previous communications said don't don't worry about doing any of that. You can just you can arrive and we will definitely have a mail uh, breakfast and lunch mail for you. Yeah, we should we should I might try to promote that again. Yeah, I was just thinking part, partly because, and obviously we want to get, we have our own reasons for wanting to get as many people as possible, but to make sure, you know, people who, whose circumstances change too, that all of a sudden, you know, that this is available. Yeah. Yep. It's happening as well. Yeah, I mean, I, you get federal funding at the paid cost of mail yep. um, for every breakfast or lunch, so it is, it is helpful from a revenue standpoint. And we, we we want to keep everybody employed here and you know, to have more to have our staff to be good if people were taking advantage of it. So, so I'll, I'll be showing up. If I may just say to you, I've been around all the schools at lunchtime and see the kids uh, very safely distanced, but happy. Happy. I mean, it does. It's just different, but they're they're very very much a lunchroom still. Um, but the box lunches are really pretty neat. The kids really like them. I've asked the kids that like them, and they just. It, it was just a great transition, you know, as we keep saying the word pivot, right? From but they, Anna McGovern and her team and, and Michael has worked so hard to, to really make this adjustment, and it's you know it's it's very different, but it, it's worked very well to this box launch. So it's been great. Thank you. Um, no, not on the remote days. I haven't driven over, but they they've all been eating at school. They've been there. I, I stood out yeah. on a remote days. It's every day we do it out here, 11 to 12, right by the parent pickup area, by the gymnasium entrance. And it is a steady, there's a steady flow with that hour of, of, of cars. So it has been steadily increasing. Um, I think every time we kind of do a reminder and reach out, we think we get five or six or seven or eight more new, new, uh, new parents or cars that day. So. My, my middle school son may be the only Student that watches these school committee meetings on YouTube afterwards, so we'll get to shut up to him. But his favorite thing of middle school is that he has a choice at lunch now. Is that like there's a whole buffet, and so he's very excited every day that he yeah. has many options to, to choose from. So I think for some of the parents that are home with kids, like there's so much to do to maintain all the different schedules. It's like one less thing you have to worry about is make a lunch for him. So I mean, it's there as an option. I think we should definitely make it work. Okay, there's nothing out there, but I'll. So what, 10 minutes on that? Bids and donations, anything on that one? <laughs> Not at this time. I think you removed staffing. Yes. But I have I have a couple questions on staffing, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I can't get that passed. So. I mean, but my only question, Dr. Daly, I mean, first and foremost, I know you've been posting for remote learning assistance and the building yeah. subs. Do we have building subs? The building subs are every, just every school yet? And what about remote learning people? Yeah, we are still looking for more building subs. Uh, we did a communication reach out to the community and to the parent community to see if they make interest. Um, we're offering job sharing for building subs for parents that may be willing to work on days their child is in school and not learning remotely, um, just kind of job share for a particular school. Um, so out right now, I think where the biggest need is, believe it or not, is the little elementary school um, as well as what Soon will be the high school at uh, the moment, but soon. Um, and I think we've also talked about in the, our last administrative meeting, in addition to a goal of having two building subs um, at each school, um, or maybe more than that, the job sharing, co rating, co um one or two floater, floater building subs that may be willing to kind of um, go between the elementary schools. Um, potentially, or even the middle school and the high school in the same building, um, you know, when the need arises, we can see that could potentially become, become a need to be there for that. 
Yeah, we were very concerned up front, and we still are, about not having the substitutes coming from anywhere, you know, but I think we see the need to have a bit of a floater. And honestly, it came out through the middle school when you have the number of teachers that were impacted in the quarantine at the middle school. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where we have to close school because there's not enough adults, right? So if we can have some others that we can borrow from in different situations. Um, I think I think we were able to stay open one day because we were able to borrow a substitute from the high school being the same campus, which is great. Um, but in, in that situation where there could be some other, you know, because some days there's going to be just a number of staff that might be ill, and then if there's a quarantine as well, one building is just going to need more help on those days. And if we can have that floater, you know, so just the idea that that adult would only be in these five schools, they wouldn't be going elsewhere, but they they might have some flexibility. It might be even more limited, as Michael said. It might be just the elementary, just the secondary, but a little bit more. So we still need some support there, and there's positions posted, and we. We certainly would love uh, folks to apply. So, what are the requirements? What are, you, what are your requirements for that? So, uh, essentially, I think it's two years of, um, of bachelor school education is, is the minimum requirement. Um, no specific licensure, or like no. No. you're eligible. I, you know, you never know. I might look for a change. There you go. Okay. On the remote learning, so we, that, that posting did get a lot of interest. So I know there's one school that's moved forward and, and made a hire. I, I'm thinking the others must be closed, but I've been monitoring that posting. There's been a lot of interest for that. Yeah, just the one hire so far that I'm aware of. But, yeah. Uh, but that's going to go a long way to help our teachers in the classrooms with some additional support and assistance. Just don't tell them to hire whoever doesn't get it as a sub. Yeah. Right. Or a building sub. All right. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Thank you very much. I'm that. sorry that that item wasn't there. I was just thinking no. about it as I was looking at it. I was scrolling down. I had the thought and I was just like, wait, I thought there was a staffing. Like, he's trying to shut me up here. That never works. No, that's what we're trying to do. That never works. Um, so, business donations, subcommittee updates, athletic subcommittee met. Ms. Batwell, Ms. Indriano. I wish I had the agenda in front of me. No, I have. Um, well, it was interesting when the meeting started. I think mentioned the last time we got together was in February, so I yeah. actually pulled my notes and was looking at it. Um, but Mr. Johnson let us know that the banners are being hung. Um, there has been some talk about the eighth graders playing up to JV, and I believe that's on hold at this point due to the COVID. Um, the shed that we did get for the Hood School. Um, that's great. Tennis courts got blown like a week or two after it was put into the woods and got destroyed. So we're looking for a, to get a new shed for that. Um, the scoreboard's been installed. Uh, there's a portable sound system, a wireless remote for the scoreboard. And the dugouts are on hold due to COVID, but they're like. The folks that were going to install it are not in school. Uh, right. But we do like that partnership and want to stick right up. So, yeah. um, yeah, and essentially, I, I think if some of what we discussed was what I discussed earlier about the winter sports, what would that might look like? Yeah. So again, we, we're thrilled to have kids on the field, and the kids are thrilled um, to have anything that's somewhat looking like a normal fall. I think the kids are thrilled with that, um, and it's been it's been great. When you're down at the games and everything, everything's uh, going well. It's definitely different, but it's it's going well, and, and we want to offer as much of that as we can moving forward. It is going to be a challenge. With the winter sports, but keeping hope alive for that quarter season, and maybe something can happen a little bit later. We're just going to keep thinking that through. Uh, we did have some discussions about that floater season, for example, if there's football and we have to shovel snow off the field. What does that look like? All those kinds of discussions are because we're going to we're going to keep trying to figure out ways working with our you know rec department to make these things happen. So. And we talked about the co-op. Did you make a decision on that? I know we kind of did like a quasi poll, sure. but I don't know if we really did yeah. that or if you. Like, I know Mr. Um, Johnson is going to bring that forward. The, the, the subcommittee definitely still supported the concept of a co-op, uh, uh, and, and so now it's just a matter of figuring out what that would look like with these sports if they go forward. But if uh, you know, there, there didn't seem to be an overwhelming concern about uh, North Reading students. Being alongside students from other towns, and I think I think the thinking there is, you know, 
we are very mindful of cohort mixing and, and all that, but this is happening with extracurriculars elsewhere. Students are playing club sports and club teams, and there's a lot of that. And to, to not, you know, to use that as a reason not to have an opportunity for wrestling or or, or girls hockey, whatever sports that we're discussing, uh, we didn't feel that there was enough at this time to do that. Now that might, you know, the other towns may be different, and there might not be support, but you know, North Reading. We felt that we were going to move forward with that. Whether those sports even run is another question as well. Um, you know, I think wrestling is one that's been discussed a lot, obviously, as being a difficult one to do with COVID. But, you know, we, we're still willing to uh, consider the co op idea. So thank you. That's, that was so, on uh, the winter sports, are we waiting for guidance or are we just, or are we just trying to figure out plans? So, there's some guidance about indoors coming out. There's going to be some updates to that as well. We're always staying tuned to MIAA, but really now we're also looking at the Cal League and what's out there. So, right. again, what's being discussed at the moment now, and we're getting closer to Thanksgiving, usually that starts the Monday after. It's no one's talking about, like, oh, yeah, we're ready to go on that Monday. So, I think everyone's even still even, trying to even practice or, you know, getting yeah. out. Yeah, so at the, I, you yeah. know, I, I talked to Mr. Johnson and Mr. LaPred about it. It seems like Anything that we do might be a little bit delayed. It's just it's just that much more difficult to do things um, inside. So, trying to figure that out. My only, I mean, if I recall, MIAA gave a list of accommodations for the various sports, like you know, we're playing defense on side. I mean, no yeah. uh, no, no heading, no like, no hand, no throwing it in. Like there was a lot of specific yeah. accommodations. We don't have any of that. For those we don't sports. have that for winter sports yet. Yeah. And so I think that's important and. The only thing that concerns me is they put this floater season. There's supposed to be four seasons. How, how on earth are we going to fit four seasons in if they don't even have the guidance on how to start the second season? Out. So. The only other thing I remember, um, Mike gave the numbers, and I believe that we're doing very well, pretty good with the budget. Right. So, I mean, there's certainly some uncertainty there with how this is going to play out. The winter and the floating and what happens. So we, we had good participation for the five sports or so that went in fall. Um, and you know, should we should everything be able to occur? Um, you know, I, I think in some of the adjustments that we've been able to make and what we've been able to carry over with the end of the cold out of fiscal twenty, um, you know, we, we think the budget's in reasonable condition, you know. Um, but certainly we have to monitor that. The revenue is a big one, and we have to monitor that. Okay. For athletics, fine arts subcommittee. Look to my left, Mr. McGowan. Is there a pop up salute? Sure. We, um, yeah, we met the same day. Um, it, was a, it was a great meeting. It was great to see everybody. I think last February was the last time. Um, the, First thing that really came up was uh, curious as school committee members and community members, what is what it looks like in the art room and kind of how how do things look in the COVID regime? And the response that we got back was overwhelmingly optimistic and positive. That the, the kids are coming in with this fantastic attitude and willingness to try things. Uh, the teachers have had a lot of real problems, like every teacher to, to solve, and they've been finding really novel ways to kind of approach them. Um, a couple of things that came up were um, uh, like a, a, a program where you can uh, post up virtual art so that people can kind of, uh, kids can see and plug in and see what other kids have made and then they can share with the teacher who post it up online and everybody can kind of see and comment on them and be inspired by them. Um, trying to come up with projects that use scarce materials because there's going to be a material shortage over enough time. Uh, the art teachers had to compensate by uh, sending kids home with some materials so that they can, can interact uh, from home. And right now that works, but they're, they're kind of planning ahead that way uh, creatively. And uh, overall, it's, it's, uh, it's such a uh, hard situation to be in a hard job. And, and what I took out of it was that doing a fantastic job of just not to put too fine a point on it, but being creative and solving it. It was really great to um, actually, you know, talk to some teachers. Uh, obviously, this is a very enthusiastic and creative group, but uh, you know, um, one of the things we, we 
we don't do too often. So it's actually one of the great things about this committee, I think, is that you actually get to interact with teachers directly. Um, so it was great to talk to teachers the first time since COVID, since we came back into school. And uh, as you, Chris said, their enthusiasm is amazing as it always is. And uh, and I think as avatars for the whole staff, I think you know we see that enthusiasm in a lot of other ways uh, on social media and, and and you folks who have kids in schools in the schools probably see it as well and it's just very impressive so good meeting and evaluation subcommittee um yeah, we right. saw the meet of that today we we back today with Paul. there you go subcommittee schedule athletic subcommittee meeting again november 18th at 1 p.m virtual Fine Arts Subcommittee, November 18th, 2.30 p.m. virtual. Do we have a fine, uh, finance planning team meeting schedule? Or not? I wasn't able to pinpoint the date. I know it's been discussed. Um, we have it. I think it's on the horizon. It feels like that's been very fluid and I know. letting people know a couple a day or two before. Uh, administrative report, anything, Dr. Daly? Uh, not at this time. Correspondence? Not at this time. Future business, November 5th. We have a meeting at 6.30 p.m. November 19th, we have a 6.30 p.m. meeting as well. Uh, before you yes. start starting to close, um, the question, the last meeting, did you decide on the batch principal search representative? Do you need to do that today? I have a note on that as well. Yes, for the subcommittee, did we want to appoint somebody from the school committee? Well, that's a good point. Um, we probably should do it tonight because yeah, so do we have anybody that is interested in that? I'm happy to do it since I have a child at the batch. I think I might be the only one here that does. I would defer to you personally. I'm happy to do it because I have a stake in the game. Anybody else have any interest? Or... Because okay. I have a ton of time with my hands. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the only thing. So I mean, you know. No, I, I, will, I will make the time. Okay. And, you know, if, there's, if I find some type of trend where I find a challenge, I'll, I'll see if I can. I hope for it to be very flexible. I've had a lot of interest from teachers and parents that have written in, and so uh, I'm hoping it's not a, a huge amount of time commitment and we can be very flexible with people's okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, to me, let's, 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 let's just vote. I, I think we'll it would do. be a vote in Mrs. Balboa to uh, be, uh, be the representative, uh, committee's representative on the search committee for the batch of the first. Okay. Okay. Roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. I just provided a similar update that the position was posted today, the interim position. Um, and, and we are having two scheduled uh, as as following the timeline. Uh, Monday the twenty sixth, there's a staff uh, forum and then also a parent forum as well. Okay. Posted internally or externally or both? Both. Okay. Thank you. Michael Storms put that as now, so I think we <laughs> time to go. Okay, I have a motion to adjourn. So second. Okay. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. Chris. Aye. Rich. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five zero. Thank you everyone.